Well, again, I just want to say thank you for joining us today online. Uh, I'm so glad that you are joining us this morning, and I hope that you are ready to really dig in and engage with the Word of God together. And uh, if you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to go ahead and reach for it and turn to the book of Ephesians. You know, we've been in this series called Unchained, and we've really been digging and breaking down the book of Ephesians. And today, we're going to be in chapter 5, and I believe that what God has put on my heart to share with you uh, is, is something that I think you really need to hear. I think it's something that we all need to hear. And I want to read a passage of scripture that is typically used for marriage counseling and, and marriage relationships. Yet I believe something deeper is going on regarding the church. And so this is what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. I want to begin our time reading God's word this morning. And it says here in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submit, submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church you know, there's a lot that we can take from this passage about marriage, but what Paul is saying is that what he's really talking about today is the relationship between God and his church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. You know, I want to take a few moments today, and uh, hopefully you are taking notes. Research, research shows that people who take notes make it to heaven. No, I'm just kidding, uh, but it is a good habit to take notes, and if, if I were you, I would take some notes today, but I want to talk to you for just a few moments from this basic thought, the bride. The bride. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you so much that we get time with you in the Word today. We pray that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and that you would speak exactly what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I think so much has been made of this year, and uh, rightly so, right? 2020 has been a crazy year. I'm kind of getting tired of talking about it, and I'm kind of getting tired of hearing about it. Um, and, and, and it's definitely been a crazy year, but the reality is, is that so much has changed for all of us, right? And one of the things that has changed for my family in particular is just how different our schedule has been because church is such a big part of what we do. Church is a big part of our life. I was thinking about it because my kids are growing up and so many of their memories and so much of their outlook on life has been formed by the church. And what I've learned is that many times we can get lost in doing church and we forget that we are called to be the church. Many times we get lost in doing church and we forget that we are called to be the church. And what I feel like is on my heart is that we have to understand that God's plan on this earth has always been the church. And many times 
we do not have a deep enough knowledge or deep enough revelation or deep enough appreciation of what the church is all about. And so today, we are going to try to answer this question, what is the church? What is the church? I think we need to be reminded right now of what the church is. And if you were to search the word church on Google, the definition that would come up would be a building used for public worship. And the reality is that a lot of people live their life thinking that that is what the church is. They think the definition of church is some place that they go. And there's no doubt that we gather in a building, but let me just be honest with you right now. Church is so much deeper than a building. How many of you know if you need to have a building to have a church, then we are not a church? The word church actually comes from a Greek word found in the New Testament, and the word is ekklesia. Ekklesia. I love this word because it speaks about a gathering or an assembly of believers. And so the church is not about a place, the church is about a people. The church is not about where we are going. The church is about who we are becoming. We are the church. And the purpose of the church has always been threefold. And the first thing is ministry to God. When we gather, we are to praise and bless the name of Jesus. And this is why we start our service with praise and worship every week. Some of you need to understand the purpose of being the church because praise and worship is not a concert at the beginning. And if you would catch this revelation, you would never miss church ever again, right? You would realize that we cannot be the church unless we are first ministering to God. And so when we praise and when we worship, it's not because it gives us goosebumps or because it is our favorite song. We are praising and worshiping God because like the psalmist said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His holy name. We are blessing the name of Jesus. And we are magnifying the name of Jesus. And this is our first ministry. But it does not just stop there. The second purpose of the church is ministry to believers. When we gather in person or online, we're going to open up the Word of God. Okay? We're going to open up the Word of God. And so preaching is not the only thing we do, but is one of the primary things that we do. If you want to be the church, the Word of God has to be opened and it has to be preached, right? Preaching means to proclaim. And the Apostle Paul says in Corinthians that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Have you experienced this? Like, we are all in different places. Some people right now are going through the toughest season of their life. Other people are, are, are going through the best season of their life, right? Some people are married. Uh, some people are single. We are all in different places. But when His Word is preached and proclaimed powerfully, God is so amazing, He can speak right to you. We minister to believers. We equip the saints for ministry. The Word of God is called the double-edged sword. And that is why some weeks we open the Word. It does not matter who is preaching, but it's like surgery starts to happen because that sword is penetrating and dealing with the hidden things of your heart. And so ministry to God, ministry to believers, and then thirdly, ministry to the world. We are called to go and preach the gospel to the world. You know, the last words of Jesus are called the Great Commission. They are not called the Great Suggestion. 
right? Jesus wasn't like, you know, guys, if you get around to it, go and preach the gospel. That would be really good. You know, that would be really cool if you were to go share with people how much I love them and how much I want to save them. Listen, he is not your guidance counselor. Jesus is not your therapist. He is Lord and he gave us a mission that we are to go out and be the church at your job, at your school, in your family, in your neighborhood. We are called to be the church. And listen, whatever we avoid, the devil will invade. We should not be afraid. We should not be ashamed, but we should be bold and we should be courageous and we should step out into the night with the light of Jesus. And so the purpose of the church is ministry to God, ministry to believers, and ministry to the world. Now, what you will find out is that all throughout the Bible, there are different metaphors for the church. And in Ephesians 5, we are called the bride of Christ. But why is the church called the bride? Uh, My wife and I are about to celebrate 10 years of marriage this November. And I want you to imagine for a moment if you walked up to me and said, Hey, Mike, I love you, man. I got your back. I'm with you all day, every day, any day. You are my guy. I will die for you. But I got to be honest with you, Mike. I don't like Ayumi very much. How many of you know that we're going to have a problem? How many of you know I would have a problem with that statement? Because you cannot love Mike and not like Ayumi. You cannot love me and not like my wife. And yet I have heard so many people say, I love Jesus, but I do not like the church. Oh, you you know, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You can be a Christian and not go to church. Well, I would go to church, but the church is boring. I would go to church more, but church is full of hypocrites. Friend, you cannot say you love Jesus, but then you do not like his bride. And of course, you do not have to go to church to be a Christian. But if you are a Christian filled with the Holy Spirit, why would you not want to go to church? Oh, church is boring might be the lamest thing a believer could ever say. Because guess what? You are the church. And what if the reason you think church is boring is because, I don't know, maybe you are boring. Church is full of hypocrites. You just figured that out? Church is full of hypocrites because church is full of people. And people tend to say one thing and do another. That is why we come to church. That is why we need grace. That is why we need a Savior. I need a Savior because I am a hypocrite. Come on. Is anybody grateful that you serve a God who is not a hypocrite? But you serve a God who came and saved you and always keeps his promises. We are called to be the church. And so why are we called the bride? Well, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands love, this is what I want to point out here, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I think the first reason we're called the bride is because of this word intimacy intimacy. Out of all the metaphors the Bible could use to describe the church, one of the key metaphors we see 
is this idea that we are the bride of Christ. And Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus and he says, Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. In other words, what he's trying to get us to see is that in marriage, the marriage bed is probably the most intimate place on the planet. Now, some of you are having a hard time, especially the guys, because many of you are like, I love the church, but this is not the message for me, man. This is getting kind of weird. I'm not really into God romancing me. I'm not really into God calling me his bride. But the problem is that many times we do not have a deep enough definition of intimacy. And when you hear the word intimacy, you start thinking sexually. You know, Ayumi and I have been married for almost 10 years. I'm just going to keep saying it because I'm so pumped up about it. You know, we've been married for nearly 10 years. And honestly, I love all of you so much. I pray for you. I try to pray for you on a daily basis. And when you hurt, I hurt. When you celebrate, I celebrate. I love you. But how many of you know I love Ayumi in a different way? My wife knows me in a way that you will never know me. And that is good news because she knows me in a private and intimate way. She has seen me. She knows me. And so a lot of you right now are hearing this word intimacy and you're getting nervous, but it is not literal. It is a metaphor. You know what a metaphor is, right? It's when we use something in the word or something in the world to give resemblance to a deeper truth. And God is trying to find something on this earth to show you the level of connection that he wants with you. And so he says, my church is my bride because guess what? I want intimacy. And could it be that God wants you to know him in a way that nobody else knows him? Could it be that God is saying, I want, you, I want to know you in a way that nobody else knows you? See, intimacy is not just sexual. Intimacy comes from a place of trust. And where there is no trust, there will be no intimacy. And so I want you to think about it this way today. What if we break it down like this? Into me... See. Into me, see. Into me, see. Intimacy. Into me, see. And the only way you are ever going to see into me is when I quit putting the projected self out there and I start walking in the actual self. I pray to God, we are never a church that you have to pretend to be something you are not. But you can be honest about how you are really doing. Because intimacy is when I see into you and I know the real you and I know everything about you. Intimacy only comes from a place of trust. And yet the flip side of this truth is that when we is that, and what we do not like to talk about very much is that intimacy and trust go both ways. And so I'm not offering you legalism or condemnation. I'm just trying to get you to think deeper as the church. We want to trust God more, but the real question is, can God trust you more? Are you living your life in a trustworthy way? Can God really trust you? The reality is the more you love God, the more you will obey God. And we all want to trust him more, but we never consider, God, am I living a life in a way you can trust me more? Because intimacy goes both ways. And so we got to live our lives in a vulnerable and responsible way. The Bible is saying the church is the bride of Christ and there is real intimacy. God is after you. He is pursuing you. He loves you. He wants to know you in a way that nobody else knows you. And he is giving you access to know him. 
in a way that nobody else knows him. It's beautiful, isn't it? We're going to continue here in verse 25. He says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. I think the first reason why we're called the bride is for intimacy, but the second reason is for protection. Protection. Now, I'm not a fighter, and that might surprise some of you because I know you look at me and I look pretty dangerous. Probably not, and you better not be laughing. But I'm, but I'm not a fighter, and there are a couple of reasons why. Number one is because people have guns, okay? And you can be 99 years old, but like you pull out a gun and that kind of levels the skill level, right? That, that kind of levels out the playing field. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know who you are. You might have a gun. And, and the second reason is I have been watching this stuff called UFC. And these fighters do not look like professional wrestlers on steroids. They look like math teachers. And I just feel like I might be out one night and the next thing you know, I'm in a scuffle. And this guy who looks like a math teacher, I mean, I've learned that you do not judge a book by its cover. He pushes some kind of pressure point on my neck. And the next thing you know, I'm like in some geometry move. Like people know mixed martial arts. UFC is a real thing. Come on, somebody. I'm not a fighter. But... But if you mess with my wife, if you come to bring harm to my wife, I might not be much, but I am prepared and I am ready by any means necessary to step in the middle and protect my wife. If I got to die for my bride, I am ready. I'm a dangerous man. I'm ready to protect her because she is my bride and she is my responsibility. I am prepared by any means necessary to protect her. Some of you need to be grateful today because you are the bride of Christ, Jesus, and you will never know until you get to the other side of eternity how many different times the enemy came and tried to attack you, but praise God, there was a bridegroom who said, I don't want you touching my bride. I don't want you messing with my bride. I am here to defend my bride. You are protected. And how do I know? Because he already did it. He already died for you. He already showed you. His death protected you. And this is what Paul is saying. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. You know how Christ loved the church? He died for the church. And the Bible says that he died so that he can make the bride spotless, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. See, when Jesus died, he took the place of you and me and his blood was shed to wash us and it cleansed us. And some of you are going, Mike, I want to be a spotless bride. You are a spotless bride if you are in Jesus. This is the gospel. This is the good news that Christ died to protect you from the wrath of God because sin has a wage. Sin has a penalty. Sin has a payment. It is called death. And Jesus died your death. I just don't ever want to get familiar with this truth. Because this is what the whole thing is about. Being the church is not about having cool events. Being the church is ministry to God, ministry to believers, and ministry to the world. And this is the gospel. Some of you right now are going, well, that doesn't sound fair. That doesn't seem right that a perfect God would die for an imperfect people. 
But it only makes sense when you recognize that he chose you to be his bride. Have you ever seen a couple? And I know you don't judge people. Sometimes I do. Okay, I got to be honest with you. But have you ever seen a couple and you look at him and you look at her and you thought, how in the world did he end up with someone like her? How in the world did she end up with someone like him? It just seems like one is out of the other person's league. And when the world looks at you and me, they should go, wow, what is Mike doing yoked up and linked up to a perfect savior? I know Mike, he's got some blemishes, he's got some wrinkles, he's got some problems. But this is the scandal of grace. Jesus is way out of our league, but he chose you. And he walks with you every single place you go so that when the world sees us, they go, what in the world is is Jesus doing with her? What in the world is Jesus doing with him? Jesus is way out of their league. But Jesus says, I chose them to be my bride. I have protected them. And if you got a problem with them, you got a problem with them with me. I love my church. And Paul is going to continue. And I'm going to give you this last little thought here before we close. He says in verse 28, in this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their own body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I think the first reason why we are called the bride is for intimacy. The second reason we are called the bride is for protection. And the third reason we are called the bride is because of rights. Everybody say rights. Paul is breaking down this beautiful picture. He's talking about a beautiful union between a husband and wife coming together and becoming one flesh. It is intimate. The husband now looks after the bride and protects the bride. But when the wife unites with, his hu- with the husband, they become one. And everything that belongs to the husband now belongs to the wife. When I first met Ayumi, her name was Ayumi Hoshino. But when I married her, she then became Ayumi Hoshino Mead. And some of you might not know that originally Ayumi moved here from Japan. And so when we got married, we had to apply for her green card. And she was able to become a a permanent resident because I am a citizen of the United States. See, when she married me, not only did she take on all of my burdens, but she also took on all of my blessings. And she now has access to everything I have because she carries my name. Some of you today, you need to get a deeper revelation and a deeper understanding that the church is the bride of Christ. And because we are the bride of Christ, we now have rights and our names have been changed. I have good news today that when you were baptized, you received his rights. That when you were baptized, you received the rights of Jesus Christ and you are righteous because he is righteous. Come on, somebody. Are you grateful today that you are not standing in your own righteousness, but you are standing in his righteousness? You have the same rights as Jesus. And I want to challenge you, church, that it is time to rise up like never before. I know what God has done has been amazing, but I actually believe the best is still yet to come. 
let us not get lost in doing church, but let us declare and decide in our spirit that we are going to be the church. We know who we are. We are the ecclesia. We may not be meeting in a building right now, but our God still rules and reigns, and we are his bride. We have intimacy, we have protection, and we have rights because of Jesus Christ. And so as we get ready to take communion right now, I want to encourage you to reflect. I want you to reflect on how good God has been in your life. How he has protected you, how he has loved you, how he has desired a real intimate relationship with you and how you have received his rights. And as you reflect on those things, you would also understand that when you take communion right now and as you take the blood, uh, the, the bread and you take the juice, which represents the blood and the body of Christ, that we are proclaiming his death And we are proclaiming that we are his church, that we are his bride. And if there are any areas of our life right now where we have kind of regressed because we haven't been meeting together, I want to encourage us to get back to being who we need to be, to being the bride of Christ, to being the bride. And so I pray today that you have been encouraged, that you have been challenged, and that you have been inspired. And so uh, would you please bow your heads with me and pray for the communion. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we are your bride, that you want an intimate relationship with us, that you want us to know you in a way that nobody else knows you and you want to know us in a way that nobody else knows us that that you that you want to protect us and that you have protected us and god that we have received your rights that we have received salvation that we have received hope that we have received peace that we have received love and that we have received righteousness because of your son jesus christ god help us to be who we need to be Help us to be the church in this moment right now. We love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.